So how did the uh, contest turn out? It was good. We got beat by us. You know, the trivia contest. Oh, yeah, the trivia contest is straight. Do you get an email about that? This is one of the emails that's alive. Did we win? I doubt we won. What do you guess that comes from? There's a trivia contest. Aren't those all like wrong? And we were like two for seven. What was it? Were there any physics related questions? No. What was the most This is like the first movie question. <laughs> oh, and that still works. Yes. Not me. 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 Not no! Pressure, send me an email and I'll send out another email. So I uh, please remind me at the end of class to leave a couple of minutes to not only to hand out. Please remind me at the end of class to hand out uh, midterm grades. Uh, so I'll talk about that before I hand it out. But don't leave without your midterm grades. Is there any yeah. No, well, I don't. It's not really midterm, but uh, we're not going to have a test between now and midterm, which is next week. So after the midterm. So I just give it out now. So next week is half the term that we've been here. Not quite. I think something like that. Yes, ma'am. It's like a cumulative grade, right? It's not like average with something else, like midterm with end of the term or anything like that. All I'm doing in the midterm grade is I'll explain when I hand it out. I just record for you your homework average and your test average. I'll just give you both. But it can change between now and the end of the semester. Yeah, you'll be visited by three spirits tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you can change, change yourself. And uh, <laughs> Wait, is that all our grades is just homework and tests? No, we can do extra stuff that you don't know about. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, there was a great for how well you ate pizza last night? Yeah. And which anyway, pizzas you ordered? There was definitely, definitely a bad grade for <laughs> some Neo. pizzas. Stop. <laughs> 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 hey, canoe pizza was delicious. No, 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 no
and this looks a lot like that first simulation we did a while back where there were just two, block, two blocks colliding without the springs. And you can see that more if we change this to 50 units. And so they're the same, right? Yeah. You see the left block pretty much stops and the right block now has all the speed. So you can pretty much simulate the collision of two objects as though they had two springs like this attached to them. And right. That's it. I'll go ahead and do it if the left block is really light compared to the right block. So same thing <laughs> as if <laughs> This kind of helps give you an idea of why an object would go backwards if it collided with something. So, anything else? So this compares to the previous demo because it makes the collision take place over time. It slows yeah. down the process of the collision rather than being an instantaneous thing where the two things just bounce off of each other, which is not particularly physical because bodies don't deform that way, they don't change that way, so they don't collide that way. So this gives you a more realistic understanding of the process by which the collision takes place. Now what are these graphs down here? You know? What are those graphs? <laughs> 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 well, both I didn't look at those. Um, so one is uh, the length of the left spring and one is the length of the right spring. Oh, DXR, graph. it's the product of the two. I don't know why that should be anything particularly physical. Is or is it the difference of the two? I guess, um, I'm not sure what that, what that plot is supposed to represent. I guess the, uh, you can just see here, that was not supposed to happen, just the spring compressing as it's... Okay. So when they're together, the left spring is exerting a force on the, on the, on the right, and the other way around is exerting a force on the block, right? So we have two springs, and then we're going to study springs in chapter six, so we'll so we can come back and review this when we come back to study springs. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, uh, let's ask a question. Why study physics? Take a minute to talk about before we get on to the, to the specifics of the homework today. Why study physics? We talked about this a little bit before. Mr. Flanagan. Because we're knowledge seeking teachers. We want to know more. Good, so we want to know truth. Why is physics important to knowing the truth? Let's raise your hand. Let's, let's do this, Mr. Jackson. Fundamental to a physical world. I mean, it's basically a fundamental study of the physical world. Right. So, why is knowledge of the physical world important for us in learning the truth? Let's try somebody else. Let's try somebody else. Mr. Avery. Because everything branches off from it. So, like, you got to look at what's around you first and be able to get, like, critical analysis of things like that, which goes into other more aspects like. Yeah, you're on the right track, Mr. Covington. It's important to learn about it because every day we're surrounded by physical things. It's, uh, everything surrounding us is part of the physical world, so it's right. important to understand what that is and what it means. Right. Now let's go even, there's one, one further step here that's not quite there yet, Mr. Trimble. Our physical world is our reality, and like everything that happens in our mind is because of what we perceive in the physical world. We're getting closer. Yeah, Mr. Flanagan. The physical world is real. Well, the physical <laughs> world is real. Yeah, I sure hope so. Yeah, it must be. Uh, everything we know comes through the physical. There isn't any exception. Everything you know came that way to your mind, through the physical. So if you make a mistake about your understanding of the physical world, it's possible to make mistakes then 
later because it's the foundation. So in other words, uh, physics is the base science, science being knowledge, generally speaking. So in seeking knowledge, we must go through physics. We must go through the physical. And if we misunderstand the physical, then we've misunderstood everything else that follows. There's going to be any sort of error in the foundation is going to show up later in the, in the structure that's built above it. Okay, so for example, let's, let's consider locomotion, which is a very simple physical thing, physical uh, step, physical process. Excuse me here, I've got to reset this again. They haven't responded to my last couple of emails complaining about this. Okay, locomotion, which is really what this course begins with, and it's the beginning of, of the study of uh, physics for us. Um, locomotion. Lo locomotion requires a cause. If something is moving, you can ask why. Why is it moving? What's the answer? If something is moving, why is it moving? It has impetus. Right. Okay, now that's a rational view of nature. You say it's moving, you can ask why, and you deduce can get to, to an answer through the principle of causality. Right? Everything that changes is changed by another something is causing it to move. All right. By contrast, what if we were to assert that locomotion does not require a cause? Do you remember that quote from the other textbook that I gave you? Something moves, just doesn't need a cause, it just moves. So what does that imply about the study of locomotion? If you start off the study of locomotion saying it just moves. That's the end of the study of locomotion. That's the end of the study of locomotion. It's the end of the science of locomotion, isn't it? What, what comes afterwards really is truncated. Because you're not allowed to ask why. It asserts that there is no cause. And you shouldn't be asking why. And so the result is a kind of physics which is like the shut up and calculate kind. Right? Don't ask why, just shut up and calculate. You don't really can't understand this. It's not understandable. So there might be two reasons why it's not understandable. One is either that uh, you object to one or the other. Either nature is rational. This is one presumption of science. The other is that the human mind is capable of understanding. It has the power to understand. This is the beginning of science. It's the presumption, both of these things. To deny that either one of, either one of these things, either there's not an objective reality, nature is not rational, that's one thing you could say. Or you say the human mind is not capable. Yeah, maybe nature is objective and rational, but pe people cannot really know any of this stuff. You can object to either one of those things. And the result is there's no science, not really, after that. Because you've excluded asking why. People can't really know why. So what you're reduced to is that is that shut up and calculate mentality. To deny something like this. So in the built in to the introductory physics textbooks, many of them, is a bit of irrationality, a serious bit of irrationality, which says there's no why, don't ask, just shut up and calculate. And it's the end of the science of locomotion. If you're really taking seriously the science as that humans can know. Okay, so if you, if you allow this to happen, then what follows is nonsense. What do I mean, nonsense? So, uh, don't read that for a second. Hold on. Listen to me. I should, I should go back. Sense and nonsense. How do we know the physical world through our senses? Nonsense means it doesn't make sense. Right? If I ask you, does that make sense? You know, I'm talking about your understanding, not can you smell it or can you see it. Does that make sense? Right? So, to, to not make sense means that it doesn't, it's not understandable. So nonsense that you might hear some people say. The cat is both alive and dead. You ever heard that one? Yes. 
Schrodinger. Yeah, he doesn't really say that. He says that's absurd. Schrodinger is actually demonstrating how absurd the Copenhagen interpretation was. He says that's ridiculous. It can't be right. But it's turned on its head these days, and it's simply asserted in some of physics texts that that is true. The cat is both alive and dead. And Schrodinger, well, he either he is he's trying to illustrate the absurdity, the, the craziness, the difficulty. The human mind can't really understand this. Or he's one of the old farts who can't quite get with the new program. All right. The moon is not there if we're not looking at it. Have you heard that one? Well, that's not, it's not the way we're okay. Yeah, that one. That one's uh, that's that's one we could talk about. Um, oh, I'm not evil. Uh, good grief! Hold on. Stop! Stop! How do I get this? There, eraser. Boy, that's a poisonous slip. Elvis. Elvis is alive in a parallel universe. <laughs> Have you ever heard that one? Elvis is alive in a parallel <laughs> universe. Or he's alive in this universe. Oh, he's here. He's alive here. So yeah, that, well, that's a different claim. This one is much more extraordinary. Something can come from nothing. There's another claim. These are all nonsense statements. And the problem originates, Rizzi contends, not specifically in this book, but in other places, um, with the locomotion. If you admit right at the beginning that locomotion doesn't have a cause, if something can happen without cause, then you've got a rationality built in right at the beginning. And that uh, there's a crack in the foundation that's a serious crack. And then what comes up on top here, you're going to have some crazy things going on. Irrationality has been built in. Okay. So, with that, that said, and the importance of studying physics, so we won't be irrational, let's turn to our homework for today. Okay, how about the, um, uh, let's see, um, the question about changing the force law that happens. So suppose we were to say uh, that, uh, so I'm, I should read the, the wording to the question more carefully. What is it, number four? That is the one I'm looking for yeah. about the changing the force law. Suppose that contrary to reality, but as the common spontaneous explanation goes, external forces are responsible for the uniform motion of bodies so that if one threw a baseball, rather than going over a home plate, it would stop as soon as you let go. This is actually, the, uh, many people do have this kind of confused understanding of motion. They think you have to push something to keep it moving. You have to push it. If it's moving, it's because something's pushing it. Aristotle got confused about this. It's not, it's not a crazy thing to think. Uh, but it's not what we observe, because you can push something, and, and if, if there's absent other forces like friction, you push it, but then you stop pushing it, it keeps moving, right? And it's that persistence of motion. So what is impetus? Do you want a formal definition? No, give me a short form. It's what keeps something moving. Yeah, I like. I don't like the word keeps. It makes something move. Yeah, it moves it. Even, even shorter, it makes it move. It's not bad, but what moves it? Now, what about keeps it moving? Why don't I like that word keeps it moving? I've seen that a couple times. Like some sort of a constant thing? It implies a force. Yeah, it implies a force. I mean, so let's let's suppose I get this block, uh, this hockey puck sliding on ice. And uh, so it's sliding there. Does anything, if I say it, what keeps it moving? I want you to keep it moving. Well, do you have to do anything to keep it moving? You don't have to do anything to keep it moving because there's already something in it that, that moves it, right? So it, it muddies the water a little bit because it is the idea that maybe there's still a force pushing on it that keeps it moving in some way. So moves it is more direct. It avoids that possibility. Another word that I've heard is allows. It allows it to move. Uh, that, one's, that one's worse. Because I, I take, take an example of, um, uh, so in football, if I were to tackle Mr. Jackson, Knock him to the ground, right? I didn't want to pick on Mr. 
computer for this. So I, <laughs> I, I knocked Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, I knocked Mr. Jackson to the ground, and somebody would say, hey, you allowed him to fall. No, that's, that's weird. You didn't allow him, you, 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 you knocked him over, right? You didn't allow him to fall. Maybe somebody else, a third party, allowed him to fall because it didn't stop me from doing it, right? But, uh, so the impetus doesn't allow the body to move. It moves it, right? It does it. It's the thing that acts on the body to the move cause. it. It's the cause. It's the cause of locomotion. And so uh, this question is getting to that, the relationship between force and impetus It's in, in this question. So... So if there were no impetus, but rather um, in such a world in which there's no impetus, what would be the analogical equivalent of Newton's second law? So instead of F is dp dt, which is the change of momentum, what would you have? Yes, sir. Times dx dx. Yeah, a a F is something times the vo velocity, right? You might have something like uh, the, the velocity, um, the velocity, is the force over some constant, you know, call it something. That would not, you know, that would be the, the velocity is a result of the force, a direct result of the force. Well, this is not what we observe, right? Instead, we have Jordan's law, which is that the momentum is what causes the velocity, not the force. So the next part is to say, well, suppose we don't even have that. Suppose we say in which a force is directly responsible for a change of place. So it's velocity is dx dt. Suppose we get rid of the time, it's just dx. So what would we have? Yeah, that's right, a, a change of place. So a, uh, a, um, uh, a delta x or a delta r. We're going to write it in terms of vectors. Again, some, some proportionality here. So you push it and it goes and it jumps instantaneously in that direction. And you push harder and it jumps farther that way. Or if you change direction, you push this way and it jumps over that way. Okay, but that's also not what's observed. Right? So those are examples of force laws, Newton's second laws in, in a different world, in a different place where things don't in a different physical world where things don't work the way that they do here. Because you can try to conceive of that. That exists only in the mind. We can do this in the mind. Try to imagine some that things aren't the way they are. Okay. Um, okay. Now the uh, question A has to do with the uh, the birds flying in a truck. So hummingbirds might be better. Hummingbirds or bees, or imagine RC helicopters. Right? You had a truck with a bunch of remote controlled helicopters resting on the bottom. It's a Toys R Us truck. And, you, and it pulls in to the way station at the state line, and they weigh the truck, and it's going to be the, the added weight. The truck has the additional weight of the helicopter, so the total weight is the sum of the two weights. All right, now the truck goes on to the next state, but in, in the meantime, somebody's gotten in the back and is flying the helicopters, and they're, they're hovering like this. And it pulls into the way station, and they do the same thing again. So the question is, how does that weight compare to the previous weight? By the weight, we mean the force on the scales. Right? So I'm going to let somebody other than Mr. Flanagan. Mr. Vessel? Would it be the same? Helicopters are pushing down in the air, and there um, it pushes a force on, imparts a force on the floor, which is the same as the weight force. Exactly. If you look at the helicopter, or the bird, or whatever, you have this thing which is hovering. It has a certain, it has a force acting on it, which is gravity. It's got to, in order to avoid falling, to hover, it's got to it push down on the air. And so there has to be another force balancing the weight. That's how a hummingbird can hover. It pushes down on the air. And a helicopter. So that air is pushed down, it's going to push on the floor with the same. So if everything is steady, and you have this steady motion and force downward on the floor, it's going to balance, it's going to be the same. So the truck isn't going to change weight. It's just the 
helicopters are hovering. Now you have to have all this has to be right. The truck has to be sealed. No air pulling in or out. That just kind of messed things up a little bit. So that's why he did those specifications. Mr. Sharp. Uh, the second part of the question was, uh, what's the mass when they like while falling? So not the not the mass. Or the weight while falling. Yeah. Right. Right. So what, what is the weight registering on the scales? Yeah. Right. So while they're falling, though, let's right. say they're at the top of the truck yeah. or at the top of the inside of the truck, they're falling. Like when they're in free fall or whatever, yeah. then there's no push back up. That's so right. it would be the mat or just the empty truck. Then they're going to hit, of course, and so the scales are going to bounce around and do stuff. It's going to be springs and things. So, right. Wait, so, so when they're falling, then they're not imparting force. Like they're no longer pushing on the air. So it's the normal force which gives it its weight, like the, the counteractive force of the force of gravity. So pushing down on the air, that push is going to be given down to the quit pushing down on the air, hold your wings, start falling. As long as you haven't hit the truck yet, the floor, and the push has stopped. Here's another one that's kind of interesting. What if everybody in China jumped? I saw that question in the book. Yeah. Um, that must have been your job in this time. What would if everybody in China at the same time jump? I mean, what thing so they would think they would put They would put, like, impetus on the earth, but the earth's so big it would well, I don't know. It's a good question. Is there enough? There, are there enough people in China that you would notice? If, if I jump, what happens? So what happens to me? Of course, I go up. That means that I've imparted by this process impetus. To me, have I imparted impetus to the earth? Not very much. Equal amount. Equal amount of impetus to the earth. But why doesn't everybody complain when I jump and I'm shaking things up? Bingo, that's it. It's the mass of the Earth. Remember, the impetus divided by the mass is the velocity. So I can give myself some velocity, but the corresponding velocity, the Earth gets the same impetus in the opposite direction, but the corresponding velocity is really, really small. So small that nobody notices it when I'm going. Is there, are there enough people in China to, to do it? I don't think so. I don't think so, yeah. It's still a big Earth, but we don't want to find out. <laughs> the next part of that question involves jetpacks. Uh, jetpacks. Did, did you see that question? That, uh, I'm sure I did. I don't remember that. that day, so uh, may, maybe we should talk about that one sometime. Okay. So now we're doing uh, something, a force, something resting on a table. So I'm going through the solution here. So you can go through this with me if you like. Something is resting on the table. What forces are acting? And normal force exists because the table has integrity and the block has integrity and one is trying to move through the other one and so the table pushes against the block. The block is also pushing on the table. This is just a diagram of forces acting on the block. So there's two. Okay, now let's suppose this thing is sliding and no friction. So let's, let's suppose this thing is sliding. No friction. What forces are acting on the body? Same, Same two. In terms of the horizontal motion, then what kind of motion do you expect? Uniform the impetus is going to stay the same. It's just going to motor along. No, no change in uh, impetus, no change in momentum, <coughs> so no change in velocity, so it just slides like that. So let's set up a problem, uh, set up a coordinate system. So I'm going to call this x, the distance from the body up to the body from a reference position, the origin. And I'm going to write Newton's equation in this for x alone. So I want the component of x. Uh, so I have, this is also the unit vectors in this direction, right? x, x hat is this way. x hat is in this direction, okay? So what is the force then acting in the horizontal direction? Zero. And then we could write, so this is uh, dm v, which is x dot, dt, and if the mass does not change, then this is just mx double dot. Dividing by the mass, which is not zero, we wind up with this e equation of motion. So Newton's second law becomes that, that there, that there is no acceleration in that direction, okay? But that's the mathematical expression 
of Newton's second law, of, of the uh, understanding of uniform linear translation. So now you were to try a direct substitution. If you can solve this by integration, that's great. I'm, uh, we're not assuming that you can integrate now, so I'm giving you the solution of this form. And you uh, can check whether this works by taking a derivative here and a second derivative. So this you need to be able to do without mistake. I think there are still some people who are shaky about this. So we're not doing this anymore. If you need help on this, come to my office or go see tutors or what. Okay, so uh, is that a solution? Indeed, yes, for all time, x double dot is zero. There's no acceleration. Okay, now what about these two constants? This I didn't put any constraints on C1 and C2. So what about these two constants? Well, it gives you a hint. Let's look at the initial position and the initial velocity. So substituting uh, time in here to zero, that term goes away. So the initial position is just C1, and the velocity is constant. It's the same for all times C2. So these correspond to the initial position and velocity. So the initial position here doesn't have to be zero. Remember, it's where this block is here, this x, where this is when I start the clock. Okay, so it doesn't have to be zero. I can put my coordinate system anywhere, and so its initial position may not be, might not be zero. Okay, so therefore, we have a combination of differential equation with initial conditions, and you can show directly that there is only one such solution. The solution is unique combination of differential equation and two uh, second order differential equation with two initial conditions and the solution is because it's unique if I find it I don't have to tell you I, I, I know what it is even if I have guessed it <laughs> it's still correct okay and that's kind of what I'm doing here I'm asserting a solution and having you check it okay any questions about that so you're supposed to make the plots corresponding to these so x of t is just a straight line. Here is x naught. This additional distance, if this is time, this, this additional distance here is v naught t. And so you can see the current position is the sum of the initial position plus the additional distance traveled. And uh, so it's a straight line. The velocity is a horizontal line as a function of time and the acceleration is just along the x-axis, goes along that height of zero. Okay, so now let's add uh, uniform acceleration. Let's do the problem of the, the body uh, moving under the influence of gravity. We talked about this yesterday. So I'd like somebody to repeat that for me. In terms of the principles of locomotion, this is part A. I'm always going to be asking this, that you, uh, not always, but I'm often going to be asking that you explain the motion in terms of the basic principles before we start solving equations. I want to hear this. So I'm asking for a volunteer. I'm going to throw this thing up. I want you to, no, I'm not going to throw it up. If I were to throw this thing up, well, would you please tell me, based on the basic principles of locomotion, impetus, mass, and force, how does it move and why? Mr. Avery. Okay, let me slow you down. And say, you said it's uh, it's got impetus because it has velocity. So what do you mean there? Uh, it's moving. So when you say it's got impetus because it has velocity, so be careful about the meaning of the word uh, cause there. You deduce that it has impetus because you see it moving, right? But the actual cause effect is the other way around. Right. The impetus is what causes the velocity. So one is the order of knowledge, the other is the order of physical cause. Uh, and then as it gets to the top, there's no velocity right. and no impetus. And, and why is it losing impetus? Because the force of gravity. Good. And then once it goes to the top, it's going to start increasing impetus in the other direction. That's why it goes false. Good. That's what I'm looking for. Okay? For that first part, that sort of thing. And we'll, we'll get into more complicated, more richer physical situations, that's basically what I'm looking for, that kind of stuff. 
Okay, so now we diagram the forces acting on this body. This is it, right? Nothing else, just get rid of air resistance. It's free fall. Okay, and then we write Newton's equation for that. So, um, Mr. Fanning, how about Newton's second law for this situation? So we're going to mark a coordinate system again. We're going to measure the height from the floor being positive being up. So y hat is up. Okay, so I want to write Newton's equation, second law, for this situation. What do I write here? Y equals mg. Okay, not y. So, so remember, Newton's second law is f is dp dt, and this is only in the y direction. Okay, so what is py in terms of the momentum in the y direction in terms of y? It's going to be a mass times times velocity, right? So momentum is mass times y dot. Okay, so PY dot, because the mass is constant, is MY double dot. Okay, Mr. Disharoon, how about the force? Uh, <coughs> what do you mean acceleration? G, right. Yeah, not any arbitrary acceleration, it's the gravitational constant, G. But it, how about the sign of this? The force. See, my y direction is up, and what is the direction, the, si the sign, uh, is it positive or negative, what I just wrote for Fy? Yeah, so I want a negative sign here because the force, so gravity is down. The mass is cancel, and the now we have a differential equation to solve, which is this, along with initial conditions, the initial height and the initial velocity, which was given to it by my hand, okay? And then by the same process of direct substitution, you should be able to show that, in fact, the solution, demonstrate that the solution looks like this. Okay? And be able to uh, go through that process to verify. So again, we have a differential equation, second order differential e equation with two initial conditions, and that's enough to, s to specify a unique solution. There's only one answer to this problem, given those initial conditions. And there it is. Okay? Now you were also to ask to find how high does it go, given the initial uh, position, the initial velocity in G. How high does it go? How do you find out how high it goes? You need to find the time, right. Time to when it gets to that maximum point. Good. So take the first derivative, and when that reaches zero, then it's reached its maximum height. So the time to the max height is going to be v naught over g, and then substituting t max back in y max is y of t max. It's going to be the initial position plus what does it turn out to be v squared over 2g? Is that right? I think that's right. Do I remember that correctly? Substituting in and doing a little bit of algebra. Yeah. So the distance it traveled uh, from its initial uh, position, the delta y, from its beginning is v naught squared over 2g. So that's how much farther up it goes, the resulting cost. Notice that at the initial velocity, if you double the initial velocity, what happens to the, the distance? Throw it up twice as fast, it goes up four times as far. That's peculiar. Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll understand that. It's a little bit easier to understand that in terms of energy and stuff, but it's not bad to think about in your mind, get that sorted out in your mind, why it is that that's true. Right? It's going to take twice as long for it to slow down. Given twice as much velocity, it takes twice as long to slow down, and if it takes twice as long to slow down, it's going to travel four times farther. Another way of looking at this is to 
make the graph y of t. It's going to look like this. It's an inverted parabola. The initial height is y naught. This initial slope here is v naught. That's the initial speed upwards corresponds to the slope there. And so you're looking for the place where this slope is zero. You're maximizing the height. The, the, the other way of maximizing is to find that where the slope is zero. That gives you the maximum value. And so that's why you, we're looking for the derivative of the position, which is the velocity. And we want to set that equal to zero because that corresponds to the point in time when it is just not moving. It's lost all of its upward motion. Okay, let's check uh, dimensionality here. We have the result delta y is equal to v naught squared over 2g. Let's check apply dimensional analysis to this. Somebody do that for me. Mr. Covington, would you like to give that a try? Um, all right, so delta y is going to be um, length over time, right? Delta y, so what is y? Oh, wait, just length. Just length. There's a change in position, so it's just the length. Uh -huh. And then uh, V naught is going to be length per time. Yes, sir. And gravity is, is a length per time squared. That's an acceleration. Yeah. Right. So let's do V naught squared over 2G, and let's find the dimensionality of that. Should be a length, shouldn't it? That's what we're asserting here with this our solution. So it's the square of length per time divided by length per time squared. Length squared, the time squared, divided by length per time squared, so this is the length. Good. Checks. Okay, you should be able to do that. You should get into the habit of doing that on your homework. I should start making that explicit in the instructions. You get down to a solution like this, I ask you how far does it go or something, and it's going to be in terms of the initial velocity, angle, gravity, mass, all these sorts of things. Check yourself to see if it in fact is a length or whatever it should be. Okay, questions about today's homework? Yes, sir, Mr. Kelly. Um, for the two graphs, I thought that the velocity would be modeled by like a sine wave, and I got the acceleration as a cosine wave. Because. Um, You're talking about for this problem with the, uh, the one we just did? Yes. Yeah, okay, one. uniform linear acceleration. So l let me first plot that. It's in the, in the solution. So I, I, I graphed. That, that's y of t there, an inverted parabola. If we plot the velocity as a function of time, so if we take take the solution here. So I included the, the force of like a hand throwing up the object. Oh, well, we're talking about after the for, after the hand has thrown it, right? You're given, that's so in the initial condition. Include the hand throwing it up? Only in terms of the initial condition. You throw it up, and, and you're looking for the motion afterwards. So the hand is only responsible, the only part of the hand, the only role the hand plays in this problem is to give it an initial upward impetus. Okay. So we're not actually like, just, we're not going to include any that, the, the force that, it, like the initial acceleration of the part is against the acceleration of gravity. Right. We're not, we're, that's only being taken into account in that after the hand has done this, it's given an initial velocity. So we're looking at the free fall trajectory of the, of the body. Right. If you want to consider the two bodies, then you could do something like the springs and things like that if you wanted to get into that kind of detail. But all we're doing at this point is just looking at motion of one body under the influence of one force, which doesn't change in time. So one body, one force that's constant, doesn't change in time, gives us uniform linear acceleration. We're taking this in stages here. Okay? So we've got a case with no forces, so we have uniform linear translation. One force with that's constant, doesn't change, so we get uniform linear acceleration. And then we're going to be building up our repertoire of motions. Okay. Any other questions about today's homework? So the, the velocity then looks like this. So this is the initial velocity here. This is that time when it hits 
when it reaches its maximum height, right? The velocity is zero at that point. It's about to turn around and get negative velocity. And so the acceleration is going to be what? Just negative g. Constant downward acceleration the whole time. Okay, so for uh, your homework, uh, for Monday, you're going to do uh, a projectile. You're going to combine these two things. So you're going to do the problem of a, a, a tree fall, but the body has been given not in a uh, completely vertical motion, but some at some angle. So it's not completely horizontal, nor is it completely vertical. It's a combination of the two. So we have some initial velocity. Let's call it uh, you know, v naught at some angle with the horizontal. And gravity is acting on this. And that's the only force that's acting. You're to neglect air resistance. And so this is a, a picture of the coordinate uh, of the system. And you're go going to be suggesting to you that you take x and y coordinates, x to be horizontal and y to be vertical. And then you're to just do the same problem now. You've got both at the same time. But because the motion is independent in the two directions, each one is one you've already done. The motion in the x direction is going to be just like we just did. The vertical direction is just like we just did. But then you're going to be given a little bit of a question, a little bit more of a challenge, and that is to find the range. How far down, down, uh, down field does it travel? What is the range? Now, what does the range depend on? Well, it's going to depend on g. It's going to depend on the angle. It's going to depend on the velocity. Maybe it depends on the mass. Those are all things that it might depend on. So what is the range? And I'll give you another one. Here's extra credit. What is the maximum height, h? Also a function of the same things. And then you're to find what angle maximizes r. What's extra credit? Or do we need to do that? No, that's in the problem. Yeah. So you're going to find the range as a function of angle, and then you want to know. Uh, okay. So obviously, if the if the angle is 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 small here, if the angle is almost zero, it isn't going to go very far before it hits the ground again. So you increase the angle a little bit, and it's going to go out farther. What if you now shoot it up? Well, it's going to come back down, boom, like that. And if you shoot it straight up, it doesn't make any range downfield at all, right? So there's an optimum angle, and you need to plan. don't guess, use math, <laughs> trig, right? No guessing, solve it with the equations. That's that's what we're getting at here is there's no guessing anymore. You can solve it with the equations. Yes. It, if, if, I, if I ask you a question, uh, uh, this, 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 I have to remind myself, this is, you know, you're, you're just learning this. If I ask a question like how far down, down range does it go, there's no guessing required. You know, I'm not asking you to guess. Right? I'm asking <laughs> you to find it in terms of the equation. So don't give me a guess figured out in terms of the, the things. And the solution will always involve the, the pieces, the elements that are stated in the problem, like the, uh, the physical constant of gravity, the initial, the muzzle velocity, the angle setting, all of those things. Yep. So I've got these, and I've, I've also got some uh, homework to give you. OK, this is my high-tech way of doing things. I, I just I do this, and I hand it out individually here. So it makes it quick and easy. So what I've got on each one of these, you'll see two numbers. The first one is the average homework grade that I have recorded for you, and the second is the average of the tests that I have recorded for you. <coughs> are the, these are the, 
and the homework is up, is up until I didn't. I don't remember if I included yesterday's homework, Mr. Hodgkins. Yeah, look on the syllabus for that. I can't remember. Okay. So it's it's done in such a way that you can build up as your expertise grows. So will the waiting towards the end of the term. It's going to be more and more waiting as we get along. The final. I have homework to give you as well. Oh, oh Logan, homework apparently. All right. Mr. Was I on the right track with that? Because this was my thought process. Was I, I thought we were included. So if I put the force on it, okay, in, in terms of the velocity, it goes so up and then it hits a point, it goes. Well, all that motion though is independent of what the hand is. No, okay, I'm only, I'm only talking about the velocity of the fiber 